It's a real joy to be with you this fine evening. Some cool air coming through the open doors and windows. It's even cooler down at the lake. It's still so light. The summer has sort of burst upon us without any much of a transition. Looking out there's such different fresh green everywhere. The leaves are still new and glossy, not covered by layers of dust. Many people have worked very hard to put this retreat together, preparing for it during the week and then moving in here in one day. And people who weren't directly connected with setting up for retreat have worked to make preparations for this week, travel, leave some food for the family. Now that we're here, can all of this drop? Very often people mention that in the beginning, at the beginning of the retreat, several days, sometimes the mind is still buzzing with all the activity That one was, was engaged in, the fallen king. Actually, it is at a time like this that this comes into awareness because our mind is always buzzing, always in motion or commotion. Always moving, thoughts always moving, wanting to get someplace wanting to get something or get what someone or wanting to get away from someone or something most of the time occupied with memories of the past or projections into the future constantly racing back and forth between the pleasures of the past and the anticipated future or the pains of the past and the future. And the body following suit with physical tensions or secretions, emotions. Never at ease or rarely at ease unless soothed by what one drinks or eats or views, listens to in this constant motion of the mind into the past, from the past to the future one is at odds with what is going on this instant at odds or in conflict with it it's inevitable if 
one is preoccupied in the mind with what was or what should be. One ignores, one can't see what is now. The people who are with one, who surround one, are either not seen at all, ignored, or they appear blurred or distorted. And then one aches from feelings of separation, isolation, lack of intimacy. So here we are coming together for seven days in silence to sit, question, listen, attend, can this energy of the racy mind gathering just being here with one's total being without knowing being like the glossy leaves without dust. We always mention some things in this opening talk. If you've been to many if you have been to many retreats, forgive us for repeating some of these things. But there are always people who have not been to retreat in a long time or for whom this is the first retreat. We have to say some of these things because they may help to create an orderly week for all of us. First of all, a new thing. We've recently had an all-day sitting where it was mentioned to the people who were attending that it was all right they didn't feel like facing the wall to face inward. So please feel free to do this if you want to experiment with it. Several people mentioned to me it was quite a different way of sitting if one is not facing a wall or facing a wall all the time. So try it. If you don't feel it's helpful, you can turn around or do, do what you wish. You cannot be struck with a Kiyosaka. We have no, no experience with this. So if you're not working with a stick and you wish to turn around, it's all right to do so. Also, what some of you may not be aware of, if you haven't been to retreat in a while, you do not have to attend sittings. It was mentioned by the coordinators at the beginning. We hope it is not too, going to be too hot here in this hall. We have no fans. So if you wish to sit outside someplace in the woods or by the lake, do so. This is your retreat. No one is prescribing how you have to sit it, what you have to, to do. Just as you sit for one round, don't leave in the middle of that round. That is one thing that we're requesting for the sake of the quietness during a round of sitting. There's no talking except during meetings. But the silence of a week's retreat is more than not talking. 
It is so intimately connected with a profound listening to the sounds that are going on, the sounds that oneself makes by walking, sitting down, handling things, working, opening a door. And in really listening, very wholly, subtly, sound does diminish because one is listening and one is careful. It's not that I must open this door quietly, but how, how does it sound? And there are people and they're resting, people downstairs sitting. One, one feels the, the need for quiet. If there's attention, then there'll be minimal noise, which is very helpful for so many people living together in one relatively small building. Lots of sounds we'll be hearing during this week which are unavoidable. We are very close to highway. And quite often in the summer months people walk into the camp. Then can the listening be open without resentment to the intrusion of, of sound, which is unavoidable? Moving with it, as it were through silence. If you need to communicate with each other, you're trying to have pencils and paper in many places, please write down your request or what you need to ask clearly and, and sign it if you leave the note someplace for somebody. And yet, particularly if one has a tendency to, to write many notes, try to keep them at a minimum. Just communicate what is really necessary to communicate. If there's an emergency where you need to immediately speak to somebody, if possible, speak to the person where you're not seen and heard by the rest of the participants to create a minimum of disturbance. In other words, when you need to talk very quickly, that doesn't, you don't have time to write a note, of course it's all right to do that. about the eyes. As long as we're sitting and moving together with many people here in this building, can the eyes be kept down while sitting at a certain comfortable angle, not open, not closed, that is the least stressful, sometimes people feel there's a strain in the eyes just by not looking straight, but this disappears after a while. There's something very worthwhile in having the eyes half open and half closed. You, you can find this out in doing it. If you have problems with it, please discuss it with me and we'll, we'll talk about it and see what, what can be done or, or tried out. It will alleviate the strain. But as we walk around, it's quite helpful not to look at the people. Although if you need to look and see how people walk about, then do it. But you'll find that as long as you're occupied with looking what people do, how they look, whether they see you, the mind is constantly occupied with comparison, evaluation, wondering about this person, the speculation starting going, how deep this person is involved in what they're doing, what, what they may be doing. The eyes <coughs> gather information that immediately the brain wants to process and interpret. 
everybody is basically doing the same thing, wondering what this life is all about, often afraid to look, afraid to question. very occupied with thoughts. We're not different from each other in this. Also wondering whether other people approve of one, recognize one. It's the same here or there. In keeping the eyes down, it's the best way to become aware of this constant tendency to relate to people in a speculative, or comparative way. And by keeping the eyes down, and for this to come in awareness, it can wither away. And there's a deepening of the attention or the questioning. When this <coughs> automatic process slows down and, and ceases, When you walk outside where there are no people, it may be different, you may want to keep your eyes down or not. Sometimes one can take in the fragrance, the sound of the, the birds, of the water, without looking, or one may look. But then, in looking at the water or a tree, the sky or the fields, the pebbles, is there someone who wants to get something out of this? who wants to become enlightened. Or is there just the sea? No grasping, no wanting. <coughs> no interpretation. Mealtime, getting up, walking to the dining area. We will sometimes talk before a meal. Can there be no change of attending or listening or questioning? An openness so that our habitual tendencies our habitual relationship to food can come into awareness, how we eat. The greed, the anxieties, the stuffing or the whatever. And with awareness, things change and slow down. And there's a new appreciation of eating. We have never tasted one's food before or felt felt it. With regard to sleep, we hope it's not too hot in the dormitories and that you can reach some agreement on ventilation versus draft in this hot weather, there's no argument about this. <coughs> there's also a lot of stuff in this relationship to sleep. I have so many ideas which have been pounded into us since we were little and had to go to sleep to please our parents. That sleep is necessary, good, important, and it is. Other ideas are that one that it's very important, necessary for spiritual practice to go without sleep. Can one drop ideas and find out what one needs to do from one day or night to another, not be bound by conventions, principles?
if one is exhausted, drained, tired at the end of the sitting, or at any time. You don't have to wait to the end of the sitting. You may, may rest, taking time off from sitting in the main hall. Doesn't mean you have to sit someplace else or go for a walk. You can rest. You don't rumble around in the bed too much. So it wouldn't be heard down here. If one can really sleep, particularly without dreams, there's a real refurbishing of the whole organism on waking up, sometimes with very little sleep, if it is deep and nourishing. There's nothing to be ashamed of about going to sleep. If one is not tired, can, can one sit or walk? Particularly if one would, would just be tossing around in bed. Or if one wakes up in the middle of the night refreshed, it's all right to get up quietly so that the people are minimally disturbed who are resting in the dorms or in the room. So that one is free of time in this retreat, free of one's habitual patterns, whatever they may be. At least let them come into awareness and question them. Experiment. What is tiredness? What is sleep? What is sleepiness? Not to, to gain something or to be as good as another person who sits there or better. One can stay up longer. These games are, are childish. Amazing. One knows this from, from one's ordinary experience. One may be so tired at one time at night and someone calls up, comes for a visit, someone <coughs> one hasn't seen in a long time or loves to talk with and before one knows it and has been up for another several hours. All energy is there, all dragged out and this is gone. And the same thing can happen here. And it's so quiet at night. But do what you need to do. It's very difficult because we're very patterned, very conditioned, and very much influenced by each other, by the past, and by what we've read. Can that come into awareness, be, be seen, so that it doesn't rule us blindly and unconsciously? In case some of you missed what was said about the stick, it's changed a bit. It used, well, I won't say what it used to be, I'll say what it is now. The coordinators will not strike people unless people ask for it. But if you wish to be struck without having to ask for it, if it is a bother to you to have to uh, wait for the coordinator to, to attend to this and then turn your head if you just wish to be struck at their discretion then write a note for that you need to write a note otherwise the coordinator will only strike people who turn their head but if tomorrow or at some point in time you change your mind you want to uh, do it differently then write another note you, there is no need for consistency that's another one of our principles to be consistent. It's an idea and a very painful one very often, which distorts our being, our relationships. It's possible to drop what one has experienced in previous retreats 
or read about retreats or sashim or what could happen in a retreat or has happened can all of this drop in just being here so completely that there's no room for the past or the future whatever you may do, be doing at the time questioning who or no or what is it or just attending, listening, questioning. When all these different things are mentioned, it doesn't mean that one person has to do them all. Whatever, whatever you're doing, can it fill so completely that there is emptiness of everything else? Without compulsion, effortless, is that possible? In coming to meetings, the last retreat, I dropped ringing the dog sign bell. It was wonderful. For people upstairs, downstairs, and for myself. First we wondered, well, what, how are we going to work this out if people don't hear the bell? You don't need to hear the bell. And there's a nice new thing, because both of us sitting there, we're both responsible for ending the meeting, not just one person ringing this bell. Which doesn't mean you have to hurry. There are, I don't know how many people here, and some empty cushions mean that people will come later. There are many people here this time, and me meetings particularly during the retreats that were, there were fewer people had a way of expanding. If we need to talk, let's, let's do it, but if we've talked enough, let's part. <laughs> and then the person who is leaving, of course, opens the door. Oh, no, we're not in this building. We're, we're having a meeting room outside. Yeah, you still open the door, and you go to the bell. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you crash right through. <laughs> First we thought we'd just have one strike of the bell, so we thought to drop all the old patterns. And some of you may think, my God, but what's so uh, important about dropping old patterns, but they are really... <coughs> For some people, they sit under the skin and in, in, in the whole system. But we found out last summer that sometimes one, one strike or, uh, may not be heard, so we're striking the, this bell twice. Please do it loud enough because the person in the other building will not hear the Stokesan bell anymore. So it all depends on the strike. If nobody comes, I'll go out and strike the bell. Also, this was a change in the last retreat, which was a relief for many people, that uh, we ask not to run anymore. Outside you can run. <laughs> but in here, some people were literally lifted up and down their mat. <laughs> <laughs> and to new people who are coming, this is an absolutely absurd and incomprehensible thing that all of a sudden everybody is dashing or some people are dashing uh, and it's, it's a disturbance in an otherwise uh, quiet setting where we ask for silence and care and then um, the running just didn't make sense and was disturbing to quite a number of people. A few people like to run <laughs> but um, 
Well, you have all the time except that <laughs> um, theory that you can run up and down the hills. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, the announcement will not be made at the beginning of the sitting, but as I go out, we found that for some reason it was more helpful too. Please return to your places. At the next bell, there'll be a walking period. <laughs>